Hello and welcome back. Let's meet Varya and Daniel. But first, let me introduce you to Varya and Daniel. So Varya is an independent consultant specializing in design systems. She's currently working with Metro Digital, where she manages all things um, UX, UI, and tooling. She already delivered a talk at this conference two years ago. So I'm pretty confident she has many smart insights to share. Daniel comes from the Metro Digital, where he collaborates with Varya. He's in charge of customer experience design across all stationary, hybrid, and digital touch points. And his key responsibilities include managing international stakeholders and strategically supervising group-wide projects. Today, they will share um, many insights about data-driven design systems and management. So how are you, Varia and Daniel? Are you ready to share um, what you find out and all about your project? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm yeah, sure. <laughs> really excited. All right. I would just now try to share my screen. Let's see if this works. So the usual question, do you see my screen? <laughs> At least I can see it. Right. Then thank you for the okay. uh, great and I kind introduction. You, but you can start with your talk. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, the previous talk just was so great. I hope that we can keep up with this. And um, let me directly jump into the topic with you, data-driven design system management. Um, just a very short introduction. So I'm Daniel working for Metro Digital and together with Varia, we're driving the Metro design system. And I will primarily in this talk share my perspective, whether from the business and organizational um, and organizational perspective on the topic and Varia. Yeah, I will share from product management and team perspective. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm also uh, serving Metro Digital as a design system product owner for already two years. And initially, I'm a freelance design system expert. Great. Thank you, Varia. Maybe for specifically, maybe the um, persons joining from the US, Metro, the company Varia and I are working for, is a German-based international wholesale company, and we operate in the horeca industry. Horeca is an abbreviation for hotel, restaurant, and catering. And basically, we help our customers to create great dining experiences. And I'm a big foodie. And that's why I love this job at this company so much. Our core business, as you may can imagine, in, is selling wholesale quantities of food and non-food products. And um, we extended our portfolio of solutions to our customers with digital things. And we operate in over 30 countries with over 90,000 colleagues, with over 900 IT colleagues um, to create over 150 solutions for our end customers, as well as for our for our um, colleagues working in all the 30 countries. And we cover so many use cases from warehouses with mean, minus 20 degree Fahrenheit uh, to regular stores, uh, depots, etc. And as you may can see from the pictures, it's really when I joined Metro, I tend to say after uh, my onboarding, um, I believe that if it has a display, we do somehow have it at Metro. And that's a very interesting and challenging environment, as you can imagine, specifically from a design systems perspective, because it's not just about mobile and tablet and desktop, it's much more variety. And including multiple brands, that's why I was really thrilled with the other talk as well. After I think one or two years, um, I joined the company. I had this great opportunity to take over the project, which was called Metro UI Library. And there was already one UX person in and one engineer. And uh, this UI library already was used by some products. Splendid, right? This was great. So I could now take over this great opportunity to finally work in, yeah, not just in a UX role. I could now really strategize design and UX and to really scale it. I literally felt like a child standing in front of this candy store because there's so much to discover, try, and experience. And I was so excited to finally work in such a big enterprise, finally doing impactful work 
in an environment which appreciates truly UX. But I need to, say, to tell you this feeling didn't last long. So because we have over 150 software solutions, we have over 90,000 colleagues, and we have even more customers using our interfaces, Metro is a massive and complex enterprise. My doubts and my excitement skyrocketed and maybe even some panic arose. But as I did shortly before this, this, this conference, conference, I took a hot shower to relax and to be calm and focused and was thinking to myself, haven't you done this kind of work already? Don't you know how to scale things in an organization like user experience or other methods? And Daniel, why doubting yourself? Why don't you do it in the same way like you did it in 2018? So introducing UX with other colleagues more and more into the company. What I just needed because I'm a very structured person, maybe I'm German, that's the reason why I need to have orientation. And what I did the last time was Googling for a maturity model. And I did it again. So I found some great resources, great resources, but however, most were either too user interface heavy or too technology oriented. I'm a user interface designer by heart, but then somehow switched on the dark side, the business, and there I cannot just live either on the user interface or the technological side. I need to somehow have a more enterprisey perspective helping me to, to steer stakeholders and organizational complexities. And that's why the model by Ben Callahan really appealed to me from Sparkbox, and I had a deeper look into it. Maybe just for the one of you who never heard the term or um, the concept of a maturity model, it's nothing else than structurized, idealized process telling you which kind of processes or phases, I think that's a better term, there exists in order to um, push adoption of a method or a thing through a company. And I would say it's completely independently if you're maybe working in a small agency in a major as software as a, a software as a service company um, or anything else. So it really, you can really apply this to every context. And so I had a look into it and I was aware that this is not a, not a silver bullet because nothing ever just happens linearly, neither in CX, UX, or in any other environment, but it helped me to structureize myself better. So the model of Ben Callan consists out of four phases, and um, Ben makes a distinction if the design system was um, a bottom-up or top-down project. In this case, I just added this as a separate phase because it just fits our um, history a little better. And I made a rough ass assessment of which phase the Metro design system, the MDS or UI library back in the days, is mostly likely to be in. And we, I think, most probably have been um, in, in the first phase of uh, somewhere between bootstrapping, moving over to building version one. And since we now somewhat do know where we are, it was time to set ambitious goals. And I really wanted to scale and increase the success of the MDS as quick as possible. So why not setting very ambitious targets? And I was really confident again. And I failed. So I don't want to say the team failed. I failed I, because I just tried to jump from you know, racks to riches, from zero to, to one, um, actually to three, and it didn't work out. I failed already jumping between the phases zero to one, because I underestimated a lot of things. The chart looks as, as confused as I felt, because I hadn't taken enough factors of influence into account. I underestimated that it's maybe even more complex to push a design system through the organization because it's less heard of than UX. Maybe I can't make too good assumptions here. I would say maybe in Europe or in Germany, maybe design systems are not as broadly adopted than maybe in the Silicon Valley or in other very big technological software um, hot zones. So being too ambitious, jumping three phases at once, um, 
again, I wasn't aware of this complexity I'm facing. So a design system like UX and other topics is a cross-cutting concern. So you will likely touch everything from organizational and technological depths up to emotions, company strategy, budget processes, priority processes. So you will fail if you don't get a structured overview of everything obvious and hidden. And I underestimated specifically the hidden things. So I really hope you never had this kind of complication, but if you did, I feel for you. One thing which hit me and the team very uh, and unprepared was the power of what I like to call now the existence justification. That it was like a wall suddenly appearing out of nowhere, being a grassroots, nobody's aware of us, being used by people here and there inofficially to, hey, we actually want to make something great and officially we need funding to now prove us why. It wasn't just the senior management or finance guys, it was basically the entire company. And we haven't been prepared for enough for this not be being prepared enough to have all these discussions with all levels of stakeholders from all layers, budgets, prioritization, staffing, technical concerns, security topics, architectural concerns. Wow, that's more than that was a lot of stuff. And another thing which may is obvious to you, um, I haven't expecting the expected delivery speed from us as the small team, keeping in mind that there was one UX designer and one developer mostly. So it just hockey sticked as well, the delivery pressure. So back to desk research, the next attempt needs to be a lot better. So core question, how might we deal with this extent existence justification toward the plethora of different stakeholder? Can we this time, hopefully, um, avoid unexpected surprises? And how might we create and collect evidence which is data helping us. So let me present you the face bridge. What a great name. Um, our current silver bullet to overcome those impediments. And it may help you to work um, comfortably across gaps as wide as the Grand Canyon. Sometimes they at least feel like that. Like that. So the first bridge pillar are people. Obvious. Okay, again, I made that error and I learned it and I hope you, uh, if you come to the same conclusion or same situation, you do it better. And most of the complexity we face and maybe you face, maybe you can relate to this, is um, people who actually create the organization and the relationships between people and topics. So the opinions, basically. And it's really important to truly understand who your stakeholders are. So not just making a stakeholder map with names on it, really understanding the entirety of those persons on a professional perspective. So how you get the insights, it's not so important. There are so many ways um, possible. Just here in selection where I think it worked well for us, for instance, stakeholder and empathy mapping, mapping jobs to be done or in-depth interviews, or actually it's both almost the same in regards of how you structure it, and lean personas. So don't get lost in creating perfect personas, just get a better understanding. So, and this then adds up to helping you to move over the gap to go to the next phase. And this translates to design system growth. So let's continue with pillar two, props. Props is rather a term you're going to find in service design environment. And there's about um, people using props, like in a film set, to do something. Yeah, this can be really everything. This can be an Excel sheet, this can be user interface, or even a, an office chair or desk in order to fulfill. Um, so the people being in an organization, what they require to do their jobs or their roles. And you should look into this. What kind of props does the company already have? Um, you may, may will uncover props you haven't been aware of. Such a prop could be maybe another UI library created by another team long time ago, and you never heard of that. 
and you may want to be aware of this. And here again, there are um, multiple methods you can apply. Here, I would really strongly recommend service blueprinting and event storming, specifically event storming when you closely collaborate with tech people. This works pretty fine. And if you like to get a bit more elaborate um, context of this, I try to answer this in the questions. So the third step, processes. And processes, business processes, company processes can be very nasty and very complex. And that's because they're either poorly or not documented. And specifically here, and in, again, mostly in our context, that's why I'm what I'm explaining you out of our experience, um, specifically the topic of prioritization and budget processes and bigger enterprises are very important to save funds in order to really finance what you're doing. In the end, everything needs to be paid for. But that's not only, um, let's say, the only important part of processes. I at least, I don't know if this is methodically right, I consider communication as a process as well. So communication, happening between people. How good does this communication work? Is it designed? Is it planned? What can I find out by this? By really trying to transparently understand the processes which create context towards the design system. You may ask, you know, what was now the outcome for us for Metro and how is this connected to data-driven design management? It's required to prepare all that to be aware who you need to address with data, what kind of data could be interesting, and then to really scale it and use it to um, yeah, create adoption, support, and everything else you need to grow a design system. So by using this face bridge in the pillars of people, props, and processes, we gain data. Qualitative data, so spoken words, so to speak, observations, and quantitative data, which we could and have automatized. And both data repositories, so quantitative and qualitative, helped us to create targeted and evidence-based communication, as well as automatized dashboards and analytics. And at this point, we're currently still evolving, so we're not done. It's not perfect. Um, this helps us to yeah, now not hit the wall again and continuously convincing now everybody we need to convince step by step by step, one person a day. And I think there we have maybe some more insightful uh, and really interesting things, but that's not my talk anymore. And I really like to hand over to Varia. Okay, thank you. So let me now share the screen. Uh... Can you see? Yeah, okay, great. Thank you, Daniel, once again for a wonderful presentation. I finally have much more sense of what you are doing day to day. And this is really impressive. And now I invite uh, everyone else to jump into the practical application of the ideas, especially for quantitative data. Here is a sneak peek of what is coming up in the next slides. Uh, I will show how, how we gather data, as well as the type of data we are working with. And then I will venture into understanding who is using the design system and importantly, who is not using it. After that, there will be a touch uh, upon the concept of user engagement within the design system. And uh, finally, I'll reveal some design system KPIs that we uh, get from the data. So I really hope this will be an interesting journey. So let's see. So before I guide you through the wealth of data, uh, and uh, I show you how we interact with it. I wanted to give you a little backstory on how we get this data. So uh, we are pretty self-sufficient in this respect, and we have started to gather this data about maybe two or maybe three years ago. 
uh, how we do it. Uh, we developed our own software thanks to our development team. It's a handy script, or I would maybe say even a package of scripts, and it does the data gathering for us. So this script uses the GitHub API, and it goes through all the Metro projects, uh, identifies which projects belong to front end, and then it clones its repository, identifies the libraries that uh, this repository depends on, and dives into a code source to figure out which components are being imported from these libraries. Indeed, this is quite a heavy task. Uh, this is why we don't execute it at once. Uh, instead, uh, we divide it into manageable chunks and we run the script uh, night, night by night so that we get more and more data every day. And uh, for storing all the findings, we opted for CSV files in Google Cloud. Uh, they are actually very large files, but they uh, get get the job done. And yeah, so this solution is quite quite good. So and finally, uh, when it comes to representing the results, we go with uh, Google Looker Studio. Uh, it, it was recently renamed, so previously it was called Google Data Studio, and it can handle our large CSVs. So everything works just nicely. So I wanted also to take a moment to discuss some of the choices that we made along the way. So indeed we could have opted for more complex, more resource intensive setup, but at least from my experience, design system teams are often struggle with resource allocation even for their core work. And if we are speaking about meta work, such as data gathering and data analysis, the approach needs to be as streamlined and, streamlined and straightforward as possible. So this is why we, uh, like we could have opted for a database and it might uh, offer great, greater flexibility in some scenarios, but uh, we found that storing data in CSV files in Google Cloud was much simpler. And importantly, it was good enough. So I would like to highlight it. And pragmatic approach exists to other aspects as well. Uh, for instance, uh, when we are using GitHub API, we get a list of repositories. But uh, this doesn't tell us uh, which products the entities within the company, these repositories belong to. So in an ideal world, we would have used some uh, company structure API from some internal system that holds this repository product pairing information. And we are actually working on it right now with our IT colleagues. But in, in the meanwhile, while we don't have such an opportunity, this still didn't stop us. So instead we came up with a workaround, we uh, created a Google document uh, and we just uh, filled uh, details about repositories and corresponding products manually. And this, is, this involved some, I would say, detective work. <laughs> so uh, I personally had to reach out to people who had made commits to GitHub repositories because it was not uh, obvious at all times uh, what the repository belongs to. And uh, often happens that the product has several repositories because they like have uh, projects within a product. So uh, I had to apply some creativity. And uh, this was a lot of work, uh, given the fact that uh, Metra has uh, almost 200 of, 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 of projects, but it was still doable. So, and uh, lastly, uh, we could have built a fancy dashboard and utilize a lot of resources uh, to its development and support. Uh, but instead we went with uh, Looker Studio. So it might not offer most customizations in terms of use, uh, but it meets our data needs. And 
we have a good enough setup and it serves us incredibly well and it gives us really tons of insights. So armed with this data, I would like to show you uh, what we get out of that. And our initial stop will be on the fundamental question, who is using the design system? A little stop. <laughs> so when we uh, started to work on this talk with Daniel, we agreed upon uh, kind of fundamental principle that we want to avoid just uh, data is important message, uh, but instead we want uh, to give you a real showcase. And we really believe that we have something admirable to share. This is why I made this screenshot. So I want to stay uh, as uh, close to reality as possible. And what you are now seeing is a screenshot of our actual dashboard. But I would like to make a remark here. Due to ending constraints, I, of course, cannot show you the exact names of the projects and sometimes even the exact names of the components and the figures. So uh, this is the very screenshot, uh, screenshot of the very dashboard we are operating with, but I wrote a client-side JavaScript to replace some strings. <laughs> this is why interface is exactly the same, but uh, sensitive data is, is hidden. Anyway, it serves us well. And uh, to help you better comprehend the insights uh, that I'll be sh showing in the upcoming slides, I would like to guide you through the interface. So we are looking at the typical uh, Looker Studio view. On the either side, you may notice the two lists. So the list of projects to the left and the list of components to the right, I have highlighted them. And these two lists uh, serve as filters to, this, to the search. Currently, there are no filters in, pl in place. So the table in the center, it displays all the projects and all the components that are imported by these projects. So let's explore the filtering functionality. Uh, when I select a specific product from the filter, the search results uh, in the center table change, and now they show only the components imported by this specific product. And please take a note, this is an uh, important feature. Each component is listed just once, regardless of how many times it's been used in the product. For instance, even if a product is used as a button component multiple times, it still be represented just once because it's the same component. But we also have this uh, count uh, field and that tells us how many times the component like button or any other component for that matter has been used. And this feature gives us a granular visibility into the use of an individual component. Uh, similarly, uh, we can filter, uh, like we can filter by project and similarly we can filter by the components on the right. And in this case, when I select the component, in the search results, I can see all the projects that have imported this, uh, this particular component and how many times. So if you look at the number at the very bottom, which is uh, 102 now, it tells us how many products are using this specific component. So it's like taking a bird eye of the spread and impact of a particular component across the whole metric. Okay, that's said. Uh, now maneuvering this dashboard, we can see who is uh, using design system, but what exactly we can learn from that. Uh, firstly, we can uh, quantify our impact by seeing how many products are employing the design system components who are dependent on the design system library. Uh, next, uh, the depth, we can uh, identify the components that are utilized by a specific product. And similarly, we can reverse the perspective and we can see which products. 
I can paint it back to it, okay? I can see what is your life. I never write my password right now, okay? So I already went through the automated system before I got to you. The automated system said they already reset the modem. Excuse me? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, was there some problem? I think we're all good. You can go on. We can see. And ah, hear. okay. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, should I repeat? Yes, fire, please. Yes, please repeat because there was uh, somebody turned on the the microphone. So sorry. About okay, that. I can start from the very beginning of this uh, slide. Yeah. So as please, you could see you. In, in in the dashboard, uh, we could see uh, who is using the design the design system, and uh, first we can learn about popularity. So we can uh, quantify our impact by seeing how many products have employed the design system. And then we can see the depth, so we can identify the components that are utilized by a specific product. And similarly, we can reverse the perspective. Uh, we can see which products are um, using a specific component. So, but the question is what we actually do with this data. So having insights about uh, the number of products that are using the design system, gives a clear understanding of the, its reach uh, and scale. Uh, these data forms a solid quantifiable message that we can deliver to our management and we can demonstrate the impact and value of our work. Of course, it is uh, just uh, one of many possible messages, uh, but it can form the basis for, for the KPI and it itself can be the primary KPI. Later, I will elaborate into a more advanced KPI, but the amount of products using the design system can be, can be KPI as well. Then uh, one of the great insights that we can gain was understanding which components are used by a specific product. Uh, that gives us uh, objective view of our customers. See, I said customers. Yeah, this is how we in the design system team call our colleagues from the product teams. And when I started, <laughs> it sounded a bit odd for me at first, yeah. But then time went on, I began to see deep meaning and philosophy behind this terminology. So uh, our product team colleagues uh, are our customers. And these detailed data lets us know them inside and out. With a deep understanding, we can serve them better. And this is all about using data, like, and which makes us better at what we do. And remember how in our dashboard, uh, we can select a specific component and find out which products uh, are using this component. So this single action opens up multiple possibilities. So armed with this data, we can dive deeper into understanding of component usage and uh, apply our uh, findings to enhance it further. Uh, one practically application uh, that we frequently use at Metro uh, was making code changes. So with data in hand, uh, we can be bolder and braver. We can uh, do changes that are typically considered as breaking because uh, we can notify or even coordinate with relevant, relevant parties in advance. And suddenly these changes are no longer, no longer breaking. They are just informed decisions. And another example is that the tasks that uh, are usually seen as quite complex, for example, uh, removing deprecated components, they turn into routine housekeeping. You just can see that, again, okay, no one uses this component anymore, remove it, and no one is affected. And this is incredible what little data can do. All right, so that was about who is using design system, but from the data, we can also see who is not using the design system. And we can see what they are using instead. 
So believe it or not, this data might prove even more important. Let's see how and why. You may have noticed that uh, when I was showing the dashboard, I missed uh, this control on, on, on the top. And now we can have a closer look at it. Apparently, this control filters the results by the origin library of the components. And by default, it's set to display our Metro React library. However, the data that we collect encompasses information um, about imports from other libraries as well. So they might be uh, public libraries like Material UI that you see in the screen, or they might be also like some in-house libraries which don't belong to design system. And yeah, you guessed it right, we can analyze this data. So here you can see that I've selected a specific product on the left and uh, we set our filter to focus on material UI. And with that, the search results are now displaying the imports of components uh, at this product from material UI library. And uh, essentially this is the same dashboard that I was sh showing, just uh, different filters. And this is why it preserves the same functionality. And just as before, the selecting specific component works as well. And I can select a button and it will show me all the products that are utilizing a button from Material UI. Once again, we have treasure trove of available data at our fingertips, and there are countless uh, ways to leverage it. So here are just few examples. So we can find out which products are using other libraries, and we know exactly what are these libraries. And we can identify specific components from other libraries or design systems that gained popularity among our potential user base. And finally, we can discover which products are using specific components that we currently lack in our design system. So uh, our data analysis can help us spot instances the products might prefer a different library over the hours. They are using something else. Why? Perhaps we are missing something. And in this situation, uh, this situation can serve uh, as a prompt for us to take a closer look and re reassess. Or maybe our colleagues working on a product, they have a hypothesis and they probably would have communicated with us eventually. But with this knowledge, we can uh, stay one step ahead and be proactive. We can reach out. Or it could simply be that the colleagues are just experimenting with different libraries, but it's, it's also nice to know. So understanding these patterns allows us to adapt, evolve, and provide design system that truly resonates with our users. Then uh, knowing about the use of specific components can provide even deeper insights. For instance, if we notice that teams are consistently using certain libraries in tandem with our design system, it could suggest uh, that uh, there might be some functionality or components that are missing from our own design system. And such insights can give us the direction for future updates and enhancements. We know which gaps to fill and we can continuously refine our offering. Then imagine we discover a component from another design system that becomes rather popular among Metro products. What can we do with this insight? Well, we can start by reaching out to the relevant people and understand their needs. So uh, like why they have to chosen this particular component. And this information can act as a compass for our design systems development We'll have a clear direction for our next steps and we'll have an understanding of how to move forward. And most importantly, we will know exactly whom we are serving. So what are the potential uh, our data holds? Well, we can also use it to enhance our customer engagement. 
Uh, let's have a closer look on how we can leverage data to foster stronger connections with our users. So I think the relationships that we build with them are as important as design system we are offering. So I will keep it brief, just one slide, uh, but it has a few potent uh, ideas to discuss. Our data contains information about the timing of each component import. And from these, we can determine when new projects have begun to utilize our design system. So uh, we can understand uh, what they are working on and proactively offer uh, assistance if needed. Then uh, when we release a new component, we can closely track its initial users. Instead of waiting for bug reports to come in, we can proactively understand the context in which uh, they are using the new component. And we can, uh, this can help us anticipate potential issues and address them promptly. And lastly, we can also monitor growth. For example, a product could be already a customer of ours, uh, but it begins to use more and more components. We can investigate why. Maybe they are working on a new feature and that might require our attention. So we can uh, like back up and uh, do some support. So uh, in a sense, we are not just tracking data, but we cultivate in the relationships. Um, now let's dive into the final topic of my agenda today, the KPIs. Earlier I mentioned that the number of uh, design system users could be uh, a basic KPI. And this is uh, particularly relevant if you are just in the beginning of uh, adoption process for your design system. However, in the Metro case, our design system is mature and already widely adopted. And because of that, we have established other KPIs that offer a bit more nuanced view of our progress and effectiveness. And I'm really glad that I can sh share it with you today. So here we are. One of our KPIs that we've implemented at Metra is the measure of unique component imports. I have touched this topic already, but let's uh, elaborate a bit more. What does it actually mean, unique component imports? Uh, yeah, Metro design system is already gained wide acceptance uh, among Metro projects. And naturally, we still have new customers from time to time because Metro initiates new, new projects. But the pace of this growth is, is not as rapid as it was initially. However, the existing projects continue to expand and um, their reliance on the design system may increase proportionally if design system is uh, good, good for that. And we realized that we need a KPI that would reflect both these facets, the ongoing engagement of existing projects and the gradual uh, addition of new ones. This is where the concept of unique component imports uh, emerged. So essentially for every project, we count only the unique components, uh, unique component imports uh, that they have used from our design system. So let's say a project utilizes a button component eight times, and, but we count it just once because it's still the, the, the same button. If the same project also employs a layout component, that would be its second unique import. And thus for each project, we understand how many unique imports they are using. And by uh, summing this up across all the projects, we gain a meaningful total. So in the dashboard, uh, you can see a highlighted figure at the very bottom, which is now uh, 1,310. And this represents the total number of unique imports across all the projects of Metro. So this actually says that 1,310 times, a product team have chosen not to start a component from scratch, or they have chosen not to struggle adapting a third-party component from third-party libraries and somehow apply Metro styles on it. 
Instead, in 1,310 uh, occasions, they utilized a ready-made component from our design system. And this uh, perfectly matched with the interface that the designers envisioned. So this is not just a number. This is a testament uh, to the efficiency and effectiveness of the design system. Okay, and just a slide to <laughs> let you know that we are going to the next KPI. Here it is. So we understand that uh, business stakeholders often speak a different language. Uh, if we deliver them the message of uh, how many components have been imported, uh, they are probably won't be so interested or uh, understand the value. And because we uh, want to speak with them their language, which is a language of monetary and resource value, we have created uh, another dashboard. Uh, the one that you, you see now. So in previous examples, we looked at the number of unique component imports across our entire code base. However, uh, not all components are created equal. So a batch component is significantly simpler than a date picker. And perhaps a larger comp and complex component might hold more value, even if they are used less frequently. So to address this, we evaluated the complexity of all the design system components in terms of hours that uh, each of them potentially saved uh, for, for the product teams. And by knowing who uses what, we can just uh, multiply and calculate a, a grand total. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, here it is. Uh, we can calculate grand total uh, representing uh, the basically return of investments for our des design system in Metro. And furthermore, we can filter by specific product because uh, this dashboard preserves the same functionality. And then the grand total figure changes and we can see the return of investments for a specific product or we can uh, reverse the perspective once again, and we can filter by one component to the right. And then there will be a list of products that are using this component. And the grand total figure will show the impact uh, of this particular component across the whole organization in terms of hours that have been saved. So, That's it uh, from the practical stuff. And my conclusion for, from this experience is that uh, armed with data, you can proactively manage your design system and you can have better relationships with the users of design system. And we can ensure that system can continuously evolves to meet uh, the needs of these users. Thank you, Varia. And maybe to my quick conclusion is, that the non-technical um, aspects are sometimes much more important than the data is, uh, as itself um, and that you really should yeah, spend time to uncover those. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, we are really curious uh, what you think. Yeah, thank you, Varia and Daniel. Um... It was amazing. Now you now I understand why you why you're such a powerful team. Um, it's a lot of work, but uh, if you could do this again uh, and differently, what would you do differently? Because Daniel, you mentioned a lot of hiccups in the start, but if you could just point out one thing from your side and one thing from your side, Varia because we have a lot of questions and we all hope that you could answer them in the Miro board later on. Yeah, but now let's just focus on one thing so people can avoid these mistakes if they start doing their own data-driven design system. Daniel, go first. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, it's a super tough question. I think I tried to find the silver bullet. Um, plus, I was maybe 
too intimidated by all the other design system existing all, already everywhere and, and which are super uh i don't know looking sp extremely nice and professional and adopted and then i just yeah. went to my to my environment and said okay that it's definitely not working so trust your own let's say gut feeling where your organization is and then create a, a playbook how to go through this process and not like me just jump start into it because you think your organization is ready for it be very skeptical if your organization is ready for it and then step by step by step grow it excellent point yeah what about you varia what would you say that was the mistake in the start yeah that's a tough question <laughs> there were many mistakes it's really hard to highlight something uh, but I can share that uh, the data about uh, component uh, usage from other other libraries, uh, we had it in very beginning because like we really have very smart development team and they took care about gathering all the data. But initially in the dashboard, it, it was not seen and we didn't use it uh, like day, day to day. And uh, I would say we are using it since a year ago, and this is really a game changer because like it's not only important like who are your users, but who are not yet your users. It's also very much important. So I would say that like this focus, uh, not, not to lose this focus. All right. Thank you so much for this excellent talk and to walk us through your amazing project. And we wish you good luck with all the numbers and crunching them <laughs> during the night. Um, so yeah, we hope to get more answers on the Myra board. And now we will have a short break um, to focus on the next next speaker. See you in five minutes. Thank you a lot. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.